What can we learn about the human role in salvation based on the covenant God made with Noah? Welcome back to Theology Sabbath School, a ministry of the School of Theology on the campus of Walla Walla University. I'm Carl Cosart, the Dean of the School of Theology and the host of Theology Sabbath School. Today we're continuing in our third lesson in the study of God's everlasting covenant, the promise. And we're looking today particularly at the covenant that God made with Noah. And to help us with today's discussion, Dr. Dave Thomas has uh, been willing to join us. And so, Dr. Thomas, welcome to Theology Sabbath School. It's always good to have you here. Thank you. And let's go ahead and jump into this lesson. We've been looking at, at creation the last two weeks and uh, how sin entered into this world and broke up the relationship that God had created and desired between Adam and Eve and himself and even between Adam and Eve themselves and the relationship to the world around them. But after that account in Genesis 3, it seems like sin just explodes. I mean, it's just one little action according to that story that they partake of the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but then explodes. Sin just goes crazy, it seems like. Um, what can we learn about sin based on this explosion after the fall? Well, that's an interesting question, Carl, because uh, I've been asked it several times in my life, many times in my life, why did a little deed create such havoc? Uh, and why did it happen so quickly? And I, you know, my own explanation to that is that there is something about sin that is mysterious and it has the capacity to expand exponentially. Uh, the best mental image that I've ever come across uh, about this actually came to me a few years ago when California had a lot of big uh, brush fires and forest fires, is that there was a story of one man who went camping, and it was a windy day, very dry time, and he lit uh, a, a fire in a fire pit, or maybe it wasn't quite in a fire pit, but he lit a little fire in a very controlled area, uh, and not realizing that the wind was going to carry sparks from his little fire and it got off into the brush and to his great horror this thing took off uh, and became a conflagration in a very very short time and I I think sin can do that I know in the Sabbath school lesson they compare it to the exponential growth of bacteria that you know they, they multiply so quickly like that and I I think that sin is there's a mystery to it uh, it obviously did not exist uh, at the point of creation, but the, the little deed that, uh, of Adam and Eve in disobeying God and eating from that, that tree um, created opportunity for sin to become a reality. And, uh, you know, to the surprise of everybody, it grew very, very rapidly. I, I continue to marvel at how when you get to the end of the creation story, it says it was good, it's very good. You have that statement. And then a few chapters later, you have that astonishing statement uh, where God says to, to Noah that the thoughts of humans are evil continually. And uh, he says that I, I'm sorry that I made humans uh, because we don't know what kind of time span there was there. But um, certainly in terms of, of chapters, it's only about four, four chapters and you're, you're, you got the whole of creation in a terrible mess. So to, to me, I put it down as, as a mystery, but a very unhappy mystery that uh, the lesson I take from that is that you don't dabble with sin because it can expand in your own life and even in this world it can create great evil that sometimes seems to be almost uncontrollable as we would see in cases of genocide. You know I wonder if perhaps the um, there's an assumption I think perhaps behind that question that might actually lead us astray and that is the, the little action of sin just a simple action and I think maybe what we learned here in this account is that, that sin, while it may seem little and insignificant to us at the moment, just a, a small discretion or indiscretion, but in reality, it's much bigger than that. Um, today we hear lots of talk about you know, systemic racism, but what we really see, I think, in these accounts in Genesis is a, a systemic sin, right? That it affects all of humanity, as you noticed, as you pointed out. And it's not a small action. It fundamentally, you know, opposed to all that God is, a path that uh, we see in those early chapters where people put themselves first, leads to murder, 
I mean, all kinds of, of horrible events that end with the account of, of the flood. So, so perhaps maybe sin is, is, is bigger than often we think. I'm just curious your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think it is. You know, Jesus, didn't Jesus talk about the leaven of sin on one occasion? That it, it you know, this little little thing permeates the, the dough in, in ways that you are imperceptible, yet it goes everywhere. And I think that sin is like that. Um, it's, it's a nasty business, and I'm, I'm quite sure that Adam and Eve were shocked uh, beyond the description by what happened as a result of their uh, disobedience. You know, it gave an occasion for sin, and it's the old story that you give a, the, let the camel get its nose under the tent, and pretty soon the whole thing will be in there, and it will be in there against your will. I, I don't think that when we do wrong, we can always tell uh, what the outcome is going to be. I think that's where maybe it leads us to some reflection on how in these accounts we see that the effects of sin, well, maybe this way, I should say this way, the, the effects of sin seem out of proportion to the actions. Maybe you want to uh, kind of say a little bit more about that? Yeah, you know, I, I, think, I think there are many evidences of that. You can see it in, in a person's life. Uh, I mean, I, I in my life have tried to help several people along the way, uh, help them substantially, and I mean by that a commitment of time. I've tried to help them overcome uh, uh, something like alcoholism that, that uh, overran them. And, you know, they, they said to me in a kind of incredulous way that, you know, when I first started drinking, I had no idea that I would get to this point. Um, you can talk to people who have committed murder and they, they, they are shocked if they think about it. You know, some people are very calloused about it, but they, they are shocked by the fact that they actually went ahead and did that. Um, that the old idea of a little hole in the, in the dike that needs to be plugged uh, holds because once it starts flowing, it washes everything away. And sin has that kind of capacity and that quality. And that's why I think we are well advised to stay away from it and not, not dabble in it at all. Um, I'll give you another story. When I was a little boy, um, I was probably about six years old, my brothers and I got into a can, we thought it was paint, but it actually was a dye called red ochre. And uh, we kind of splashed it around, we were playing with the stuff, and when we went home, my mother was horrified. Our clothes were completely ruined because we had these splotches all over us. But the worst thing about it is that when it lands on your skin, it actually dyes your skin as well. It doesn't just wash off. And so for several weeks, we went around with these, with these red spots all over us, something far out of proportion to what looked to us like a little innocent game of sticking sticks in a bucket of paint and splashing it around. And I, I think that that's the story of sin. It's, it's a nasty creature. Yeah, it makes me think of this attitude that, you know, sin is something that we can control. It's like getting a little, you know, bear cub or lion cub and thinking, oh, this is so cute and cuddly. But uh, it becomes something far greater. And the end, as James says when he talks about temptation, temptation leads to sin, and sin ultimately leads to, to death. And there we see, I think, the, the, the challenge and the evil that came from the result of, of Adam and Eve. I guess I'm curious, um, you know, it is interesting to think, as you mentioned, it goes from being very good to basically almost absolutely completely bad except for Noah and his family. And, and Noah's called a, a person who's blameless and righteous in his generation. I guess I'm curious your thoughts on this idea of maybe perfectionism. Could we say something about that? Is, is, is Noah a, a sinless person? Is somehow he has a, a higher degree of, of, of sinlessness than others? Or what is it that would lead scripture to call someone blameless. How should we, how should we understand that? Does he have? Does Noah have a halo on his head, and he's, you know, other than us? Or how do we make sense of that? Any any thoughts on that concept of, of, of human perfection based on these comments about Noah? You know, I, you know, I, um, I'm going to start in a slightly different place, Carl. That it's fascinating to me that we do have people in the Bible who grew up in wicked ages. Uh, very wicked times, and yet they remained uh, uh, blameless, to use a Bible term. You certainly have that about uh, Daniel. You know, Daniel lived in a time when the, the nation had gone so far into idolatry that uh, God was going to send the Babylonians in to overrun them and, and, and send them into captivity as the covenant had promised. 
and of course you have Noah and I'm sure that we could find other people like this and it's an interesting question I don't think that speaks to what we call perfectionism you know per perfectionism is an idea that is that is actually produced by adopting a, a Greek philosophical view of perfection and trying to impose it on the Bible uh, in the Bible, the story of perfection is a growth from infancy to maturity, and it's, it's the retaining of faithfulness uh, toward God. It's not a, a matter of never sinning. Um, the idea that you, should never, that you should reach a point where you never sin actually comes by taking the Greek idea of perfection, which means faultlessness, that they imagined a domain where, there was, where everything was in absolute perfection. There was no error, omission, no anomaly of any kind. And people borrow that idea and impose it on Jesus' words, uh, you know, be therefore perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And even if you look at the context of that, it's a very balanced thing where God sends the rain on the, on the, on the just and the unjust and the, um, you know, the sun to shine the same way that God is acting in a very responsible, mature way, if I can use that word. Um, and so, you know, the, the drive to perfectionism, I think, has come into Adventism partly from that misapplied definition of, of perfection, but also I think from, from Wesleyan theology where we Wesley, John Wesley thought you should be able to achieve um, complete sanctification. Um, people who try that uh, oftentimes, or many of them, live very discouraged lives and they finally give up on, on the whole story of trying to achieve salvation. And I have told many of them along life's way that if you just turn around and look behind you, the door to the kingdom is actually right behind you. And it's there by grace through faith that you find redemption, not by achieving perfection. So would, would we say that a person should strive for holiness? I mean, we don't hear much about uh, sanctification or holiness. Um, are those like, you know, uh, antiquated concepts? Or, or should Christians really do seek to pursue a life of blamelessness? How would, like, how do you live the Christian life in a practical sense? Or do we just say it's all by grace and so we don't worry about our actions? How does, how does that concept play out in the Christian life? The, the best way I can describe that is just to quote to you the words of a very familiar song. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim. Is that we make a very fundamental mistake when we think that we are going to overcome sin. The fact of the matter is that if we allow the presence of the Spirit in our lives and we orient ourselves to God, that sin falls away on its own, it becomes very disinteresting. And I saw this very dramatically years ago when I baptized a young man who um, had been living a very hard life. And by, I mean, by what I mean by that, he was a rough character. He drank a lot and smoked and, you know, he, he caroused. He was, he was a, a, a rough in all those areas. And after his conversion, all of those things disappeared from his life very quickly. In fact, he told me one day, he said, I can't believe I have no interest in smoking. Beer seems very stupid to me. And, uh, you know, my, my attitude toward other people is very changed. And he said, I didn't even do, it, do, do that. I don't know how that happened. And uh, it's because the Spirit of God had come in and changed his life and changed the orientation of his life and, and all the business of sin and, and that other stuff which di distracted him from the struggles of living all fell away. And, and I think that that's the answer. I think that's the answer, that uh, if you fight sin, it might beat you. If you fight to be connected to a Savior, the Spirit of God will make those things irrelevant in your life and they will disappear. Sometimes through struggle, but many times they just fall away as, as inconsequential. It reminds me of conversations I've had with several people who've struggled with various aspects in their life, recognizing that their behavior was, was not good, but finding themselves you know, always stumbling and uh, trying to find a way to improve themselves. And one of the things I've told them, kind of piggybacks on your comment, is that, that I don't think you can find a solution by focusing on the problem. In fact, it just almost seems to tie you more to it. In the same way that uh, I think in the Gospel of John it says that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness doesn't comprehend it. If, if the only way to try to get rid of darkness in your life is, is not by, you know, trying somehow to push darkness out, but it's by letting the light come in. And I think that really is the key. As you said, the light of God's love manifest in Jesus can come in and transform our lives. And that only happens by God doing something in us, not us somehow trying to, you know, climb a, a higher mountain of holiness. 
Yeah, although I do have to say this, Carl, that I, you know, uh, I don't want it to sound like these things just automatically fall away all the time because sometimes there is a struggle involved. And I read a very, very perceptive article some years ago of a man who had descended into the abyss of, of uh, pornography. He had got in incrementally until he was completely hooked on this. And he realized it was ruining his life and ruining his marriage and all kinds of things. And so he began to pray for a miracle, which is what we want when we get in the mess. We want a miracle and no miracle came. He said that and he realized that he had gotten into this predicament incrementally and the Spirit of God was leading him out of it incrementally. And so over a period of about a year and a half, he struggled mightily against that and he discovered that every time he resisted a, 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 another indulgence in, in pornogra pornographic stuff is that he got a little stronger and he got a little stronger and he went a longer period of time without connecting to it and he began to feel when he did lapse how terrible it was and so after a period of about a year or so, he was completely free of it and was disgusted by it. See, but it didn't happen just one time, it happened incrementally and he said he learned a wonderful lesson there that sometimes if you get into a mess incrementally, the Spirit of God as a form of growth and, and discipline, and I don't mean punishment when I say discipline, I mean the development of good structures in your life, that kind of discipline, that it happens incrementally and not suddenly. You know, thinking about the story of Noah, to kind of continue back with our conversation, um, Noah, Noah preaches for a long time and it seems to be little uh, effect, little results from his preaching. I'm just curious, why is it that the truths of salvation uh, generally uh, often seem so unpopular with the masses? <laughs> I've thought a lot about that question and I actually have, a, a, I think, a reasonable answer to it is that, that, you know, Paul says that the human heart is enmity against God, it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. He said that to the Corinthians, that uh, we are not oriented toward God, okay? And the call to salvation is a call to turn away from yourself and your self-interest and self-indulgence to, toward God. Um, I remember an elder, one of the first people I ever baptized many years ago now, he, was, he became the elder of the church, but he told a wonderful story. He brought a yield sign to church one day and he told the little children, he said, this is my favorite sign because it gives me a choice. Okay? It's not like a stop sign which gives you no choice. It's not like a green light which doesn't require a choice. He said, this is one, and then as I journey through life and my ideas and my will run up against the will of God, I have a choice. And the invitation is to yield, to surrender, not your personality, not your intellect, not your mind, but to surrender your autonomy, is to defer to the, the invitation of God, to keep deferring to God's way instead of my way. And that, I think, is the core problem, that when you tell people especially in our highly individualistic age, that the salvation comes by giving away your autonomy and deferring to God, this is very bad news to a lot of people because we all want to govern our own ships and be masters of our own destiny. That's not how you obtain salvation. Salvation comes when you give way to God. And I, I love that uh, story of wrestling with God. You have several stories of people wrestling with God, uh, particularly Jacob, he wrestled with God I say until God won. And I love the William Miller story when he was first asked to, to preach and he had made a covenant with God, if somebody invites me, I'll go and preach. And his nephew shows up and if you read his memoirs, I have a copy of his memoirs, he said that he left his nephew standing on the step and he ran out and threw himself on the ground, the face down on the ground in the, in the woods, begging God, I don't want to do this, I, I want to call off the deal. And I loved his phrase, he said, I went into the woods a farmer and I came out a preacher, that he had wrestled with God there until God won. And that's the story of, of the Christian life and that's why the truths of salvation are unpopular. They call you away from self to deference to God and we don't like that. <laughs> no, I don't think we do. Um, you know, this, this, this story, the Noah story, is, is, has so many interesting points uh, to it. I'm curious if, if we might spend a little bit of time talking about the, the character of God. Um, you know, we hear a lot about God's character in Scripture, God's the God of love. Uh, and I've heard some people, when they come to the, the flood account, 
have a hard time reconciling that with God, a, a loving God. In fact, some have gone as far as to say that that you know the flood was really not God's action, but the result of of Satan destroying the world. Um, how do we reconcile this form of judgment um, with a God who is a God of love? Are those two incompatible? How do we negotiate that that balance? This is, I mean, it's a huge theological question. Um, but how could we deal with that here in the story of Noah? Well, I, I think it all depends on your definition of love, Carl. What is love? You know, we think of love as a soft, soupy, fluffy kind of a thing where you never do anything to cut anybody across anybody's path. And I've said to students in some of my classes in the past that God is like a mother bear. His love is like that. He will not stand by indefinitely while his creation and the people whom he loves are being destroyed. Okay? Any more than you and I as a parent would stand by when somebody tried to steal a child from our midst and run off with it. We, wouldn't, we, 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 would, we would resort to drastic action to prevent that from happening. And I, that's how I see the love of God. God is not going to stand by, and I think the flood is, is a very significant testament to this, which Peter referred to in, in chapter 3 of, of his letter, uh, you know, when he talked about the destruction at the end of time, that he refers back to the fact that the earth was once destroyed by water, it's now going to be in the future destroyed by fire because God is not going to stand idly by indefinitely and allow sin to triumph. So that would be my explanation. Uh, 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 my favorite definition of the wrath of God is that it is a, his settled determination to rid the universe of sin and its residues. And so if you want to be embroiled in sin, I can tell you now you have an appointment with destiny. One day, God is going to say, enough of this. The, the issues are, are resolved. It's time to shut the whole thing down. And that's going to be the end of the story. And you may say that's drastic and it's not loving, but actually in the largest sense it is loving because evil is a destroyer and it's destroying everything good and God will finally get rid of it. I think certainly we could say that also in the uh, account here in Genesis, God is not a capricious God. He's not fickle. Uh, you don't see him lashing out against humanity, you actually see behind that uh, a steady call for people to respond. I mean, God is the one who chooses Noah, who has Noah preach, and it's not just preaching for a weekend, it's this constant call for people to find salvation, to, be, you know, to come in the ark, but in the end, people choose to turn and walk away. So, so God certainly here, you see him active, it's not, um, I mean, God makes it difficult for people actually to be lost because he continually reaches out, bidding them through Noah to come, come in the ark and find salvation, but, but they consistently refuse to do that. And Carl, that's the story of the prophets in the Old Testament. They always come out with this warning. I mean, the most dramatic one is Jonah when he goes to Nineveh and he says, 40 days, Nineveh's going to be destroyed. And, you know, that doesn't look like there's any condition attached to that. And yet when they repented, uh, God, God changed his mind, uh, justifiably so. He's not out to destroy people, he's out to destroy evil. And I mean, I love the ending of Jonah where Jonah has a pout fit. He's mad, you know, that like, oh, I wish I'd never come here because I know, and he makes the statement, I know that you're a kind and loving God and you pursue righteousness. And, and God finally says, well, Noah, give me a break. You know, what about all the people and even the animals? You know, have you no concern for them? And, and the book ends. I, I sometimes wonder if the final page on the book of Jonah is missing somewhere, because <laughs> I'd like to hear a better resolution, but you're left hanging there. Yeah. It is interesting how in the Noah account that the animals respond and humans don't respond. And sometimes animals are smarter than us. They, they recognize the warning. And of course, God, I think, was involved in, in, in calling them but more animals responded to the call than humans did to enter into the ark. Some, I have some admiration for Noah, you know, that he preached for how long? For over a hundred years. And it resulted in the turning to faith of nobody but his own family. You know, that's a tough assignment, Carl. That's a tough assignment, to see no good effect of your labors for over a hundred years and yet to persist that this man was absolutely convinced that God was doing something and they all thought he was a kook. Well, you know, that's the, that's the thing. You risk believing something in life, and sooner or later you'll find out whether it's true or not, and usually at a point at which you can't go back and fix it. 
You know, there's something to be said about Noah, um, and your, your comment made me think about this, is that you're right, he had no results except for the salvation of his family. Yet in the end, isn't, I mean, that is like the ultimate, I would think, uh, achievement would be the salvation of your family. And it seems to me at least um, that sometimes the hardest people to reach are those who know us best. <laughs> um, yet Noah was able to reach the life of his family, which I think is, 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 is truly amazing. Yeah, you know, hearing the gospel and then turning away from it inoculates you against hearing it again. I've often thought of that, is that once you hear the gospel and you respond to it, if you turn away from it, you're far more resistant to it than you were when you first heard it. Yeah. You know, this lesson we let off with this uh, question about what can we learn about the human role in salvation based on the covenant that God makes with, with Noah. And we see that covenant uh, early on, and then again, I think chapter 7, and then chapter 9 again. So can we talk a little bit more about what this covenant is um, and what it reveals about God and what it reveals about the response of humans? Well, I mean, I, I think that as, as all covenants in the Bible are, is that they are made primarily by God, at least the ones that amount to anything, that God makes the covenant. And the reason I like that question, and I read that same question as you did, it was in the, in the official lesson uh, pamphlet. Um, I like that because it, it's very clear that the provisions that God makes for us require a response. Okay, now it's not my response that it's not by my response that I earn redemption, but without that response, I do not receive redemption. That God does not impose this on people. That the covenant was there for Noah, and God had made all the provisions. He 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 gave him a fair warning. He told him what was going to happen. He gave him the means of of saving his family and even saving the inhabitants of the of the of the world however you, you see that. But Noah had to respond and re remain in a responsive mode. He had to keep building the ark. He had to keep preaching. Not to earn salvation, but because this was, was creating the avenue for his own escape, if I can use that phrase. See? Uh, and so um, I, I know I hear people say that, well, salvation is all God, it's all God. Well, there are elements that are all God. God has set up the whole system but the system is uh, needs human cooperation. See, if we don't ever respond, and, and I mean, I, I've heard so many people talk about the unconditional love of God, and I, I've told people, I even preached a sermon about this a few years ago, and I said, you know, the love of God may be unconditional, but it may not benefit you at all. Okay, the fact that God's love is unconditional or is unending may not benefit you at all. If you never respond to it, and never keep yourself in a responsive mode, the, the, the unconditional love of God will be meaningless in your particular experience. So that's what I think about that covenant with, with Noah, is that we learn from this that yes, God makes the provisions, and God is loyal and faithful in carrying out those provisions, but if there's no human response, there is no salvation. Yeah, and I think uh, maybe the distinction in your comments there is that without human response, there's no salvation. And I think, I think looking at the covenant in chapter 9, and let me just read, read the passage, it's 9, uh, verse 9. Behold, I establish my covenant with you, your offspring after you, with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, every beast of the earth with you, as many as come out of the ark. It is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. And there's the, the title for this week's lesson, all future generations. I've set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I'll remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh." So perhaps I think in, in, in one sense we would say that that covenant is universal, that, that every single person on planet Earth benefits from, from God's love in the fact that the air we breathe, that God has promised never to destroy this world in this manner, 
that that's a blessing we benefit from, but the ultimate gift of salvation is one that requires a, a human response. So, so God is the initiator. God does something for all humanity, but in the end, salvation requires, requires a response. Yeah, and you know, Carl, when I think about the Noah story, the, the people I think about with the saddest element, or the saddest element in the story are the ones who helped build the ark. I think that Noah didn't build that himself. These people helped build the ark. I assume they got compensation for it. They heard Noah, they interacted with Noah, they, they got to know Noah and his family, and they built the ark, but they never went in it. And, uh, you know, it's kind of a tragic story. Well, you know, the story itself is a story of God's amazing grace, and yet we see the flaws of humanity both before the flood and even after the flood, where God recognizes that the thoughts of people are evil. And we see that even with the breakdown in Noah's own family with the events that take place after the flood. So, so certainly Noah is not, uh, he and his family are not all perfect. They're humans like the rest of us. Um, and there's a call for all of us to heed God's covenant and to respond. You know, as our, our time is, is quickly running out, um, but maybe there's one other question we can talk about just for a few minutes. And that is this idea of the remnant, um, you know, a, a, a small group that's saved. And we see this concept of a remnant with Noah and his family because the entire antediluvian world, I mean, the, 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 the world is destroyed by the flood, yet only Noah and his family. Um, as Adventists, we often talk about a remnant at the end. What, what can we learn about this concept of a remnant from the story of Noah? Wow, that, you know, I, I can't give you a short answer to that, Carl, but I'll give it a try. You know, it is true that Noah and his family are the first recorded remnant, although you could argue that Enoch was one too. But um, this idea of the remnant is a very interesting one, and as, as you said, it plays a big role in, in Adventist history and, and thought. Um, but I, I think you can look at it several ways. You can look back in history and see what I would call a historical remnant. There are ca places where a group of people who are faithful to God in spite of circumstances are found. You can look at Noah, you can look at uh, Israel when they came out of Egypt, you can look at them when they came out of Babylon, you can look at other places uh, uh, along the way. These people are characterized, in my opinion, by what I call a pilgrim mentality, that they are anchored by what they know God has done, but they are drawn forward by the promises of God, and so they live in a tension between the known and the unknown. And they are journeying, as Abraham said, looking for a city that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So they, they are anchored by what God has done in, in history, in their own lives and in their communal lives, and maybe even in the history of the world. But they are not stuck there as an orthodox person would be. They are looking for what God is going to do. And so they, they, they are feel somewhat dispossessed of, of the earth. Um, so you can say there's a historical remnant, then, then that would also mean that there's a current remnant. And I would say that in our day and age, there are people, and I don't think you can identify them all, there are people who are journeying as pilgrims. They are, uh, you know, when, when the Bible talks about gathering people from the four corners of the earth, I imagine these people all over the place. Uh, I think some of them are not even, don't even subscribe to the, the name Christian. They are people who the, the pilgrim ethos is present. They, they are trusting in God and they are journeying under the direction of the Holy Spirit. And Ellen White says in Desire of Ages that even among the what we used to refer to as the heathen, there are people like this who have never heard the, the law of God or the name of God, and yet that ethos per, uh, pertains in their lives. Um, I think the early Adventists identified with that mentality. And I think that if, if, if we mean by remnant that we are striving to live under that mentality, I'm all in favor of us being uh, calling ourselves a remnant. If we see ourselves as an exclusive group, the only ones who are doing this, then I think that's too sectarian for my, my thoughts. Uh, I think then there's a third element, is the eschatological remnant, that there is going to be in the final days a group of people who are gathered from the four corners of the earth at the coming of Jesus, and I think that's going to be a surprising group. Some people think it's going to be only 144,000 people. I think we're going to be very surprised at who makes up that remnant because we don't know who's living today under with, with that that pilgrim mentality. And so that's kind of how I look at at that uh, that um, 
thing. And I, I make an appeal to one of my classes which where we talk about remnant that in this life, let's live as pilgrims. Let's not be so tied to this world that we, everything we have and hold is, is here. Let's rejoice in what God has done in our own lives individually, what he's done for us as a church, what he's done for the, the faithful of, the, of all history. But let's be drawn forward by the promises that he has made. And one of the things I've always loved about Adventism is that the urgency of our faith does not come from the fear of hell. It comes from the hope of seeing Jesus again. And uh, I hope we keep that alive, and I hope we keep this pilgrim mentality alive. We are a movement more than a church, and let's move on until Jesus comes. That's how I like to see this. Well, Dave, I think we'll wrap it up with that with that appeal, I think, showing the, the practical call we learned from the story of Noah. So thank you again for joining us for Theology Sabbath School, for your insights, and also to you, our viewer, for tuning in once again. And we hope that uh, you'll join us next week as Dr. Judy Washburn continues our discussion of God's everlasting covenant in the pages of Scripture. So until then, take care, God bless, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.